Hello, I'm Cornell Clayton. I'm the director of the Thomas S. Foley Institute at Washington State University. And on behalf of the Institute, I want to welcome you out to our continuing series on the 2020 election. Between now and Election Day, on November 3rd, we will be bringing you weekly events with some of the nation's leading political experts and scholars talking about various aspects of the campaign and the election. All these events are free. They are open to the public. We uh, live stream them on our YouTube channel where you can see them as live events or see them at a later date. I wanna thank the College of Arts and Sciences at Washington State University for supporting this series and for supporting the Foley Institute. If you'd like to know more about the series or about our programs at the Foley Institute, you should like us on Facebook and you'll receive information about our upcoming events. Or you can go to our website at foley.wsu.edu. So today we're gonna to be looking at the politics of the electoral college and electoral math. On November 3rd, when Americans go to the polls, most Americans believe they'll be voting for either Donald Trump or for Joe Biden. In fact, they will be casting ballots for a slate of electors, a group of people chosen by the political parties who will meet in state capitals a month later to cast votes for the actual presidential candidates. This system of choosing a chief executive is unique to the United States. No other major democracy has anything quite like it. It was a system that was created out of political compromises at the Constitutional Convention in 1787, but it has never really worked the way its framers have envisioned. Today, it dramatically influences the way presidential campaigns unfold, and it has sparked new controversy for its undemocratic results. Although the Electoral College usually mirrors the popular vote, on occasions, it deviates because electors are not proportionally distributed across the states, and they cast their votes, electoral votes in block. This has occurred on five separate occasions in American history. However, before 2000, it hadn't happened since 1888 when Grover Cleveland won the popular vote but lost in the Electoral College to Benjamin Harrison. But in two of just the last five elections, Republican candidates won the presidency without winning a popular mandate. George W. Bush in 2000 uh, won in the Electoral College after being narrowly defeated at the polls by Al Gore. And in 2016, Donald Trump won in the Electoral College despite losing the popular election to Hillary Clinton by more than 3 million votes. In the current election, models by Nate Silver, The Economist, and Sam Wang all suggest that Trump could win the Electoral College even if he loses the popular vote by as much as three to five percentage points. In addition, Litigation over mail-in ballots and allegations of voter fraud could throw into doubt the winner of the popular vote in many states in November. This would politicize the process of choosing electors. So what should we make of the Electoral College and its role in our elections? Why do Americans continue to use this arcane system for choosing our president? Does the Electoral College structurally advantage one party over the other? And what role is it likely to play in November? Well, to help us sort through some of these questions today, we have Matt Lebo. Matt is the department chair and a professor of political science at the University of Western Ontario. His research focuses on political parties in Congress, the presidency, and elections. He has published widely on strategic decisions that political parties make to balance electoral and legislative goals. He also studies research methodology and time series analyses, including electoral forecasting. In addition to numerous scholarly articles, Matt's most recent book is Strategic Party Government, Why Winning Trump's Ideology. It was published by the University of Chicago Press. Let me also say that uh, several years ago, Matt was one of my colleagues here at WSU when he was a visiting professor. So it's really a pleasure to, inv uh, and to invite him back uh, and welcome him back to WSU, even if it's only virtually. So uh, Dr. Lieber is gonna speak for about 30 minutes after which we'll have some time for discussion. If you have questions, I encourage you to send those to me at tsfoley at wsu.edu. Again, email those questions to me at ts as in Tom S. Foley at wsu.edu. So Matt, I'm gonna turn the time over to you now and I'll be back at the uh, end of your uh, remarks with some questions from our live audience. Okay. So I'm sharing my screen now. Uh, thanks so much for the introduction, Cornell. It is nice to be back virtually. Uh, it would be nice to be uh, in Pullman 
um, visiting with you in person, but sometime soon, a future election. So um, today I want to talk about the Electoral College, Electoral Math, and uh, some election forecasting. So let's talk about what the Electoral College is. Um, and Cornell's introduction covered, uh, covered some of the basics. Each state has a number of, the number of electors equal to the number of members they have in the House of Representatives, plus the number of senators they have, and that's two senators each. And the District of Columbia gets three electors uh, due to the 23rd Amendment passed in 1961. So that gives us a total of 538 electoral votes. Okay, so th that means you need 270 electoral votes to win the presidency. The presidential candidate who wins the plurality in a state wins all of the state's electoral votes. You don't have to have a majority, you just have to have more than anybody else. And then you get all of the state's electoral votes. And there's two exceptions to that, Maine and Nebraska award electors by congressional district. So it's a little bit more complicated there. The winner of a state is determined and certified uh, in the state by the governor. And then that tells us which slate of electors votes will count when they're counted up uh, in Washington, DC. I've got a link there um, for the state official instructions if you, if you wanna follow that. If no one gets 270 electoral votes, for example, if there's tie, if there's a tie 269 to 269, which is mathematically possible this year, or if more than two candidates get electoral votes, or perhaps if some set of electoral votes are not accepted um, by, by Congress, then you could have less than that. And then the decision goes to the House of Representatives to decide and it's each state delegation gets one vote. At the moment, Republicans would have an advantage on that tiebreaker, but if the Democrats can do well in congressional elections and especially win back two House delegations, I think in uh, Michigan and Pennsylvania, then they'd have the majority of state delegations uh, and they'd, they'd be in good position for that tiebreaker. All right, so uh, each state has a set, has a slate of electors appointed by each party. Okay, the rules sort of vary from state to state, but the Democrats have their slate, Republicans have their slate, and then at the, the election is about which slate gets to cast electoral votes. So the idea of a faithless elector, somebody who won't do what their state says, that doesn't happen very often, right? The idea that, that a state votes in a certain way and an elector decides uh, that they wanna vote differently uh, that has happened occasionally. In 2016, it actually happened. Hillary Clinton lost a few more faithless electors. I think that Donald Trump did. But now it's, it's even more difficult to do that than it used to be. There was a Supreme Court case actually about Washington State um, that just upheld laws that prevent faithless electors. So when and where, the electors meet in their respective states on December 14th, and then they're all counted in the first week of January and overseen by the president of the Senate, who is Vice President Pence. I've got in the background here a picture, uh, it's a bit grainy, but uh, that's in 2000, where if you find this video on YouTube, it's really, it's surreal that Al Gore is the Vice President at the time, he, he's, and he's the President of the Senate, and he's the one who officially had to uh, recognize the electoral votes that you know put George W. Bush in the White House ahead of him. So you have this strange scene of senators addressing him as Mr. President and handing in the electoral votes uh, that put George W. Bush into, into the White House. All right, why do we have an electoral college? That's, that's a good question. It was really a at the Constitutional Convention, there's arguments about who should pick the president. Should Congress pick the president? Well, there's worry you know, that then there, there might be um, the possibility of of uh, secret deals made, that the president is just sort of working with Congress, that the president would be beholden to Congress in a way that people weren't happy with. There was also worry that um, perhaps just straight democracy, you know, that hadn't been seen in, in, in a long, long time. So there's worry about, you know, the, the mob ruling. And the idea was that, that there would be a temporary body that would be created quickly, act as intermediaries, and then disappear. They'd be sort of free from corruption because they wouldn't exist for a long period of time. They just, they'd come and they'd go. And then there were also worries about states, uh, small states and slaveholding states who wanted to be sure that they couldn't be outvoted too badly. And that, that was sort of had, had an impact on how the Senate seats were allocated and had an impact then on the Electoral College as well. And so the Electoral College protected small states with outsized voting power, just as it does in the, uh, 
as it does in the Senate, or as the Constitution does in the Senate. So what that results in, so this is, um, this tells you the, the state population here and the number of people per electoral vote in a state, okay? So Texas has 38 electoral votes. That works out to be 733,000 people per electoral vote. California, close second, uh, 713,000, Florida, 710,000. When you get to the bottom though, you know, then you're really dealing with, uh, with small numbers. Um, then you're dealing with, sorry, I've got my, that's in the way. Uh, in Wyoming, for example, there's 195,000 people per electoral vote. Vermont, 208,000. Now this isn't all, um, it's not that all the small states with outsized electoral vote power are held by Republicans, but on balance, that gives them an advantage. On balance, the, the outsized win in California really means that it's difficult for the popular, you know, it's easy for the popular vote and the electoral vote totals to, uh, to differ from each other. So as Cornell said, you know, we have this estimate by um, Nate Silver that if the election were, were within zero or one points, the chance of Biden winning in the electoral college is 6%. One or two points, the chance of Biden winning 22%. For him to be really the heavy favorite, he has to be ahead by four or 5%. For him to be a slam dunk, you gotta to get to about five, six, seven points. So while Hillary Clinton won by 3 million votes in 2016, Joe Biden might win, need to win by more than that, right? So there have been historical cases where the electoral college winner and the popular vote winner have not matched. Uh, 2000 was of course the, uh, the famous example of that. But in 2000 and in those other cases, there wasn't an understanding that, that structurally one of the parties had an advantage and one had a disadvantage. In 2000, the day before the election, a week before the election, there was just as much talk about Gore winning the electoral college and Bush winning the popular vote as the other way around. But 2020 is really unique in that we know going into the election that the electoral college is giving an advantage to Donald Trump. And that's, that's unusual. That sort of undermines some of the legitimacy of the Electoral College, right? It's not just a matter of, well, it's, this isn't, we don't know if, the, if, if who wins the popular vote will become president. Now we know there's a structural disadvantage to one party and that's problematic in a representative democracy. So if you look at it, you know, among the many, many things in American politics that's, that's politicized, the Electoral College now is as well. Right, so 23% of Republicans say that they want to amend the constitution to get rid of the electoral college, but 89% of Democrats want that, right? It's, it's something that advantages the Republican party. Not surprisingly, Republicans wanna keep it just the way that it is and Democrats want to get rid of it. So this is, this is an awful lot of information, but this tells us the story that uh, citizens will go to the polls on election day, the votes are counted, uh, the, in each state, the candidate who receives the most votes will, will be the winner. Of course, you know, counting uh, how votes are going to be counted and mail-in ballots and overseas ballots and all that will make this year extremely complicated. Each state will decide based on the winner who, which slate of electors casts electoral college votes. Then the electors will meet in their respective state capitals. And then um, Congress will get together and calculate those votes and see who has 270 or more. All right, so now I'm gonna switch over and start talking about electoral forecasting. And um, there's two distinctive categories of election forecasting. And one of them uh, I'll talk about today. And the other one, I think you'll get a good uh, view of in a couple of weeks when uh, Professor Charles Franklin uh, does, your, does your guest lecture. So I wanna to talk today just about sort of what I call old school political science forecasting models. And what these are really about are trying to find what are the fundamental factors that are useful in predicting elections. And that word fundamental is thrown around a lot by political pundits. When I say fundamental, I mean the underlying social and political and economic forces that determine the vote, right? But not about the polls, not about the campaigns, they're not about you know, what happens in the last few minutes or last few weeks or debates. They're long range based on the real important um, fundamentals. 
So these old school forecasts will use some, some fundamentals and they'll make one prediction. They'll make it early on and then they're stuck with it for 10 months or sometimes four months. Um, and in the process, the point is that political scientists and maybe some of the general public will learn something about political science, learn something about elections, learn something about forecasting, even if it turns out that the forecast is wrong, right? We'll learn something about the underlying patterns. So for example, one, one fundamental that's used is uh, the percent change in GNP. And we can use that. This is in the, the first six months of an election year and to predict how well an incumbent will do when they run for re-election. So we look at 1980 is at the bottom of this, uh, bottom of this regression line, where you see um, that there's negative GNP growth in the first half of 1980. And not surprisingly, that leads to a president being thrown out of office with Jimmy Carter getting less than 45%. On the other end of the scale, 1984, the economy is doing really well in the first six months of 1984. It leads to a big win by Ronald Reagan. Other years with big, um, big wins by, by sitting presidents and the economy roaring along, 1964, 1972. So the economy is a decent fundamental to tell us about how things are going to, to work in the, uh, in the election. This is the president's uh, Gallup rating in, the, in a, the approval rating in July of an election year. And this is how the president does in the election. So again, Jimmy Carter, not so popular in July Gallup poll in 1980, led to his loss. 1964, Lyndon Johnson's very popular. That helps him win. You can look at other years here. So this is, you know, you can see most of them fit on this line. It's a pretty linear relationship. There are a couple interesting observations that are, that are off the line there. So for example, here's, this is Ronald Reagan in 1984. He was uh, not that popular because Democrats really couldn't get on board with Ronald Reagan in 1984. Um, so he did much, he, he won a landslide, but he, in the summer, he wasn't that popular. 1972, similarly, Democrats couldn't quite admit that they were ready to vote for Richard Nixon, but he won a huge landslide in 1972. And this one's really interesting, 2000 is down here with where the distance from this, this um, the election result from where you might predict it based on presidential popularity is really due to the, to the gap between Bill Clinton's popularity and Al Gore's popularity, right? Being somewhere on this line might tell us what would have happened if Bill Clinton had been able to run for a third term, then his popularity could have helped him. But instead we had Al Gore you know, trying to cash in on Bill Clinton's popularity, but he wasn't the same person, obviously. All right, so the second kind of forecasting models are sort of the poll aggregators and modelers like 538.com and The Economist, where there's lots of polls. Those change multiple times a day. You get an up to the minute guess about who's gonna win. There's not one forecast, there's thousands of them. And the goal of these exercises really are quite different. All right, so, uh, what I want to concentrate now is just on one of the most popular political science models. It's called the primary model. And this is, um, uh, this is done by uh, Professor Helmut Norpeth, who's at uh, Stony Brook University, used to be a colleague of mine. He and I have worked on British forecast models together. And I'll go over what his model uh, predicted. So first in 2012, in 2012, he, he put out his forecast on January 11th, to, uh, 2012. And he said that Obama would win by 53.2% to 46.8% over whoever the Republican candidate was going to be. And if that was, uh, if it was Mitt Romney, it would be 53 to 47 or so. And then if we look at 538's forecast, this is on November 6th. This is on the day before the election in uh, 2012. And Nate Silver, after months and months and months, an additional 10 months and thousands of polls, stuffed in here came up to pretty much the exact same conclusion, right? So you can see from a political scientist perspective and maybe just from the general public's perspective, there's something valuable about that long lead time, understanding that what the fundamentals are and, and which ones matter is a really interesting way of thinking about where elections are going, okay? So um, this is a statistical model that predicts the outcome of the popular vote, but it uses only two factors. I showed you two, two fundamentals before, but it doesn't even use those. It doesn't use presidential popularity, and it doesn't use the economy. All it uses are two things. One is what, what we call the swing of the electoral pendulum, 
okay? And the second is the results of early primary contests. It predicts early on and in 2020 for the first time it's predicting the electoral college. So this is sort of a graph of the electoral pendulum. So the idea with the electoral pendulum is it swings from Democrats to Republicans and back to Democrats. It swings with some regularity, some periodicity that can be quantified um, statistically. And then you can use that to make a prediction of where it's going and when it's going. All right, so this has gone back and forth in favor of one party or the other for a long period of time. And really the key insight of this model is that for, for a second, don't think about you know, just who the president is, think about which party is holding the White House. So now it's a Republican. Before the Republican, it was a Democrat for two terms. Before that, it was George W. Bush, a Republican for two terms. Before that, it was Bill Clinton for two terms. And it goes back and forth with some regularity. If you think about which presidents have taken the White House from the other party and then given it right back after four years, there's only one, right? And that was Jimmy Carter in 1980, right? There's, so though there have been cases of sitting presidents who have lost re-election, uh, Gerald Ford, George H.W. Bush, but they were serving second or third terms for their party. So that's really rare. A 1980 situation, they got the, pres they got the presidency, four years later, they give it back. To find another case like that, you have to go back into the 19th century. In fact, to Grover Cleveland, that's a typo. It's 1896, not 1898. After two terms, the electorate is usually ready for somebody else. That's another common pattern, right? It's really rare for the presidency to be held for two terms and then to hang on for a third term. The only example of that is 1988, George H.W. Bush serving effectively a third term for the Republicans following Ronald Reagan. You have to go back to 1948 to see uh, Harry Truman winning um, in that case of uh, fifth term for the Democrats. Now, the second key factor in making these predictions is the strength in the primary. So a, a candidate who does well in the primary is usually that's a sign of strength that they're gonna do well in the general election, but a candidate who does poorly in the primary, that's a sign maybe that they're, they're in trouble, all right? So candidates have to battle for their nomination, especially presidents who have to battle to hold on to their nomination, they're in trouble. So the model uses the percent of the New Hampshire primary won by the candidate who's running in the election. And that again, tells us something about what might be predicted in, in 2020, right? So um, Donald Trump had an easier time than Joe Biden did in the primaries this year. All right, so presidents who ran for reelection but had trouble in the primaries, that's a small number, but they were all big warning signs. So this is 1976 and Gerald Ford was running for the Republican nomination. He was running for reelection and Ronald Reagan challenged him. And a lot of Republicans would have preferred Ronald Reagan, but uh, Jerry Ford managed to beat him out. And this was a really staged photograph of them getting together, sort of making up on the stage of the Republican convention. If you look in the background, you can see some very suspicious staffers who are not happy um, uh, about how, how this relationship developed over the course of, of the Republican campaign. And I think until he died, Gerald Ford blamed his 1976 loss on that challenge by Ronald Reagan in 1976. 1980 is another example. Here's Jimmy Carter pretending that he likes Ted Kennedy. Jimmy Carter also to this day would blame his 1980 loss on Ted Kennedy, who was a serious challenger in 1980. Uh, Ted Kennedy um, uh, really pushed Jimmy Carter um, and, and weakened him for the, for the fall election when Jimmy Carter needed all the strength he could get to defeat uh, Ronald Reagan, which of course he didn't. And then 1992, Pat Buchanan challenged George H.W. Bush, nearly won New Hampshire. And that was a sign too of George H.W. Bush had lost some enthusiasm, especially among the right wing of the Republican party and that he was, he'd lost enthusiasm, sort of uh, gave some indication that, that he was in trouble. Uh, it was a good indicator that there was room for Ross Perot to jump in as a third party candidate. But again, there's three sitting presidents. The ones who had primary challengers are the ones who lost. So thinking about the strength of primaries being a good indicator, we know that Donald Trump uh, barely had a challenge this year um, and just, just went straight through his primaries pretty easily. And this isn't even the full set of candidates that Joe Biden had to beat. This is only uh, 27 of his competitors that were more than 30. 
So he didn't look, you know, like the the uh, anointed candidate uh, early on, of course, um, whereas of course Donald Trump did. All right. So what does this tell us for uh, 1996 to 2012? You know, the forecast predicted that Clinton would win, it predicted that Al Gore would win, which was correct in terms of the popular vote, predicted that Bush would win in 2004, Obama and Obama again. It does a pretty good job because maybe in part because the electoral pendulum has been so reliable over uh, the last 30 years. And in 2016, though it, it predicted that Donald Trump would win the popular vote, um, he of course didn't win the popular vote, but he won the general election. But it was a, this was still a decent indicator that things were swinging away from the Democratic Party, even though Barack Obama was a, was a popular candidate after eight years, the pendulum swinging back, just generally the electorate is ready for a change. So what is it this year that makes us think that things should favor Trump? Right? So President Trump should be in a good position in 2020 because he went straight through the primaries without a challenge. He's facing somebody who did go through a serious primary challenge and had to beat, a, beat off uh, more than 30 candidates. And he uh, is the sitting president in the first term of a party, which usually means that he'll get uh, reelected. Okay, so the, the, um, the primary model says that Donald Trump is gonna win with 91% probability and is gonna win 362 electoral votes. And this was done in um, March 2nd, this was posted after it became clear Joe Biden was likely to be the Democratic nominee. Uh, and further it goes on to say that the, this should translate into 362 electoral votes. Now, that's not what I expect to happen. And I think if we talk to President Norpeth, and this is his, uh, uh, Professor Garpa, I gave him a promotion. If we asked him, you know, does he believe this? He'd say, well, that's what the model says, but maybe he doesn't believe it either. Um, but it's really interesting to, to show if we get a, a real big deviation from this, that tells us something about 2020. This is what should have happened based on the fundamentals of where the parties are and uh, the, the, the uh, job that the candidates had to have to get to this point. But to think about 200, uh, 362 electoral votes is really, really difficult uh, to imagine. It would mean that Trump would have to win every one of the 2016 states that he won, plus pick up a bunch more states. And the ones that are you know, closest to him getting that would put him to that number would be Minnesota, Nevada, Virginia, New Hampshire, New Mexico, New Jersey. You know, the world where Donald Trump wins in New Jersey uh, in 2020, uh, that's, that's, you know, that's not gonna happen. That's hard to imagine, but it tells you just based on these fundamentals, how good a year it should have been for a Republican running uh, for re-election. So why is Trump underperforming in this election? Uh, what, are the, what, what do we know about these patterns um, that, that uh, he should have won? Um, there's certainly, there's the pandemic effect. There's the effect of uh, the economy uh, doing poorly. Um, what's more likely? It's more likely that this is going to be a close election. I would guess today it's, it's near certain that more people will try to vote for Biden, but it's still close in the Electoral College. When Biden has to win by you know, five points or more, then it's still close in the Electoral College. And there's states where it's still within four or five points. Key states like Pennsylvania, Biden isn't ahead by you know, 10 points. He's not ahead comfortably. So really as of a few months ago, there were sort of six states that people had their eyes on as being key. But over the last couple of months, you know, there's other state polls that more and more have put some states into play that maybe we didn't thought, maybe we didn't think would be in play. Some others are, you know, kind of unexpected. So let's look at what states are safe. And this is maybe outdated because there might be a couple of safe states on here that aren't so safe anymore. So again, this starts with Hillary Clinton's number, 232 electoral votes. That's what she won. There are some states that Donald Trump won that are no longer safe, right? Arizona, the blue wall of Wisconsin, Michigan, Pennsylvania, North Carolina, Iowa, and then there's some, uh, Florida as well. Then there's some states that are really getting close. Uh, Texas, I have Ohio still here in red, but Ohio is close now. 
Um, Joe Biden is closer in Ohio than Donald Trump is in Pennsylvania. I worry that I was disconnected there. Yeah, I think you're back on now, though. I'm sorry about that. Should I back up a slide? Uh, sure. OK. So I was just looking at the, the electoral map here. Um, and starting with the 232 electoral votes that Hillary Clinton won and seeing, well, which ones are available for Joe Biden? It's, of course, the three blue wall states, Wisconsin, Michigan, and Pennsylvania, that uh, um, put Donald Trump over the top. Those now Joe Biden is comfortably ahead. And Joe Biden's ahead by a little bit in the key state of Florida, maybe in Arizona as well. So when we take some of the states and we're a little bit more um, optimistic on, on Donald Trump's side, uh, we're, we're really left with six key swing states, Arizona, Florida, North Carolina, and those three blue wall states. And um, that's really where the election is, right? The election now might be Michigan is comfortably ahead. Uh, Biden is comfortably ahead, I'd say, in Michigan. Wisconsin and Pennsylvania, perhaps he's only uh, about four or five points ahead. Florida, Florida is one of those, you know, Florida in 2020 might look like Florida in 2000. Uh, there's a Republican governor who's a big fan of Trump's and uh, uh, it's hard to say what will happen in Florida. Okay, so today I've, I've got a map that has, um, I've color coded this so that the blue states are ones that I'm sure that Biden will win, red states the ones that I'm sure Trump will win. There's all sorts of states that have moved over in just the last couple of weeks. Ohio, I don't trust that Ohio is really gonna go for Joe Biden, but polls are showing now that he's ahead. And so between the states that he's um, uh, sure to hey, Matt. win. Yeah. Matt, sorry, sorry to interrupt. Uh, you might uh, go screen share again so people can see your map. I didn't know that it had disappeared. So there's 185 um, electoral votes that are sure for Biden. And then this huge chunk of, of ones where he's leading in the polls now, uh, that's, you know, that includes Ohio, Pennsylvania. Um, so it's, it's possible that Joe Biden could win by an awful lot. And I've been saying for a while that I think the most important state this year is North Carolina. If Joe Biden wins North Carolina, uh, then there's, it's really, there's no way that Donald Trump is going to win the election. But also, the, the key vote that might hold the uh, balance of power in the Senate is perhaps in North Carolina. If the Democrats want the presidency and 50 Senate seats, then that Senate race in North Carolina is really a key one. So uh, just to, to put up one last slide here, these are the last four elections, uh, daily polls. Um, and this is Joe Biden in 2020. And these are three other elections, uh, 2012, uh, 2008, 2016. And you'll see that Joe Biden is not just ahead by more, but he's consistently ahead, right? At the, at the peaks of previous election years, at the peak of 2008, Barack Obama was, was doing about as well in the polls as Joe Biden is doing now, where he's even slipped a little bit. So that's really something that's remarkable about the 2020 election so far, um, is that Joe Biden's lead is so uh, consistent. And what that's probably due to is that people have a really good understanding of who Donald Trump is and what his presidency looks like and what another four years of his presidency would look like. The people who like him, they're not going anywhere and he's unlikely to, to add more people on. So the 46% of the vote that Donald Trump got in 2016 maybe is his ceiling. And it seems like perhaps his electoral strategy is to just try and win those people back. All right, questions and I'll, I'll stop sharing now. All right, thanks, Matt. So maybe I'll start off with a question uh, that Janet Katz asks, and it's just a basic question about um, if the electoral college isn't proportioned to, to population, how do they determine electoral college votes for each state? So it's, the, the House of Representatives is supposed to be proportionate for population, um, but it can't be perfect because it's, it's really got to do a lot of rounding. So it's, it's uh, you know, if Vermont gets only one seat and 
North Dakota and South Dakota get only one seat in the House of Representatives and uh, Wyoming. Obviously those states don't have the exact same population. So you get some uh, deviations, but every state will have as many electoral votes as they have members of the House of Representatives and everyone will have two senators. And it's really that addition of two senators that uh, gets you, you know, from a really un, uh, state with very few people that gets them from, you know, one, one to three quickly. That's really where a lot of the um, uh, disproportionality comes in. So a state like California and Texas won't be that uh, won't be that different from each other. But when you get into the smaller states, then there can be really big differences there. Okay. Uh, so, so Aziz Makani asks, you know, given the the uh, undemocratic structure of the electoral college, um, how sustainable is is this uh, system in the long term, and how urgent is it to change the electoral college? Well, that's a great question. You know, so you you can have um, seemingly undemocratic uh, outcomes in democracies. Um, I'm, I'm in Canada where Justin Trudeau got 33% of the vote and he's the prime minister and the leader of the conservative party that got 34% of the vote is now out of politics, right? So democracies aren't great at turning the will of the people into representation, but it can only happen so many times without the process losing legitimacy. And that's a big part of what, what makes democracies work is a shared understanding that the people who are leading it have legitimacy, that they were elected legitimately. And there's certainly been some erosion of that in the United States. So I think that we, we said, okay, the, the Democrats won elections in 2008, they won it in 2012, they won both, the Electoral College, the popular vote. But in 2016, they won the popular vote but lost the presidency. In 2000, and in 2000 they won the popular vote but lost the presidency. So. The last two Republicans to have won the popular vote were in 1988 and 2004. That's 32 years. The only victory was, was 2004. And yet we're about to have six Supreme Court justices approved by, uh, nominated by Republican presidencies. Now that calls into question some of the legitimacy of the Supreme Court, some of the legitimacy of the electoral system. So how long can that go on? I, I don't know, but can it be changed? I don't see how it could be changed because now that it structurally helps one party, you're not gonna get both parties to agree that it needs to be changed. And you need both parties to pass a constitutional amendment. Now there are ways that it could be gotten around the way that Nebraska and Maine get around it or some kind of interstate compact where states agree that they're gonna divide them up by congressional district. That's possible, but a constitutional amendment that will um, get rid of the electoral college. I, I cannot imagine happening when it clearly helps one party and they won't want it changed. Okay, so I got I got a couple of questions about uh, other responses to to the electoral college, but and I'll, I'll get to those. But uh, Joshua Heiler asks, do you think that if there was a contingent election in the House of Representatives, would that lead to a legitimacy crisis uh, for the next president? And what would be the consequences of that kind of a crisis, in your opinion? There will probably be a legitimacy crisis for the next president um, in any scenario. If, if Joe Biden were to win the election comfortably with 400 um, electoral votes, let's say, Donald Trump probably will still be screaming that states were stolen from him, that there were illegally cast votes, and there will probably be 20, 30, 40% of the population that will believe some of that, and that will, that will hurt the legitimacy of a, of a, a President Biden. Um, but yeah, many, many paths are gonna have different legitimacy problems. And if the House of Representatives is the one that has to decide, I suppose it would, you know, the, the scenario that got the election to that point, that might tell us something about whether it was perceived as legitimate. Um, you know, George Bush, George W. Bush had a lot of problems in his presidency and a lot of, a lot of Democrats um, didn't quite accept that he had been elected president, but it didn't really undermine the, the, it didn't you know, undermine his ability to act as president. And four years later, there was, a, there was an election that was sort of business as usual, uh, 2008, 2012, they're pretty usual elections. Things sort of got back to normal. So a lot of it has to do with how the losing side handles it. Um, that Al Gore in 2000 really did the country a favor by eventually 
conceding and saying, I disagree with the Supreme Court's decision, but I, um, I respect it. And it's, it's time for me to go away. I think it was pretty close to what he said. Um, I don't expect to hear Donald Trump say those things. And so um, that's a worry. Okay. So um, as you say, it's unlikely we're going to have a, a constitutional amendment given the hyper uh, uh, partisanship and polarization right now in the country. But there are some other alternatives to address what are seen as the undemocratic structure of the Electoral College right now. One alternative is, is something that's been called the National Popular Vote Interstate Compact. I wonder if you can talk a little bit about that. Well, um, so if, if states were, let's say, followed a bit more of the Nebraska um, or um, uh, main model and sort of and, and thought about um, they could well one possibility is to just decide things by congressional district that gets a bit fairer and perhaps that the electors um, by Senate um, that you have because the senators could go with the state uh, the state plurality winner or you could have the, the case where several states agree that the electors that they would choose would be based on the popular vote um, uh, that happened nationally. And so again, you have each state has a slate of electors. And if a state said, well, we're not gonna look necessarily at what happened in our state, we're gonna look at what happened nationally, um, then that's a way of over having the electoral college, but, but yeah, and I, around it. And I think about 15 states have already signed onto that compact at this point. They have to get at least two, and, and states that represent at least 270 electoral college votes for it to work. And they're not there yet. Um, if they did get there, do you think that that solution would be constitutional? It would certainly be challenged, I assume, in the Supreme Court. Do you have an opinion on that? As a <laughs> what's constitutional and what's not constitutional is up to five Supreme Court justices to decide. Um, and I suppose if 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 it were, you know, our worry would be if it were to hurt one particular one political party over another, and the justices were political. Uh, then, then they might decide that it was unconstitutional. Okay, so, so another way to address this problem, at least uh, some Democrats have argued, is to uh, recognize statehood for Washington, D.C. and for Puerto Rico. Griffin Grubb uh, asks about this. What's the, what's the possibility that, that might happen, do you think? You know, I think, um, especially, and the Supreme Court pick plays into that as well. You know that there, there there can be lots of things that are within the Constitution that are that are um, big pushbacks by the Democrats. Um, so that's about the Electoral College, but it's also about sort of fairness in, in the Senate. When California has two senators and North Dakota, South Dakota, Wyoming, these these um, um, states uh, have two senators as well, then Democrats are looking well. How can we balance that out? And yes, they could add D.C. as a state and they could add Puerto Rico as a state. And it could be that two years later, four years later, that Texas becomes five states, right? So when, when, when th this is what I think about because I used to teach Texas politics, um, <laughs> that when Texas joined the United States, it was its own country. And it's the only state that when it joined the union had a specific provision that it could at some point decide all on its own to secede from itself and form five different states. So I think if you get the state of Puerto Rico, you might be looking at five Texases down the road. Um, but I mean, what we're talking about are, you know- Of course, really, of course Texas is trending blue right now, right? It's so right, so not, it's not necessarily true that all five Texases would be red states. Um, but we're talking about really unusual ways of trying to rebalance a democracy that I think most people agree is is out of balance or really at, at critical junctures, and it's that's a really, you know, these are these are tough things to gauge of how to do them. How do you how do you fix a broken democracy? Is it by going on and doing additional things that are undemocratic, or that one side will scream are undemocratic? So, um, so I got two questions here. One from Quinn Armstrong, who asks, um, why do you think Donald Trump is, is um, so unpopular as an incumbent president and his impeachment, does that, has a, did the impeachment play into that? 
And then Malaya uh, Lukitas asks, uh, why is Biden doing so well? Is it because of his exposure as, as Obama's vice president? So, so, so what explains why oh, oh, Biden seems to be doing so well, particularly given what the models would predict and Trump not doing so well, given what the models would predict? So I think the, the models are useful for telling us what, what should have happened this year, um, perhaps in the absence of uh, uh, a pandemic, perhaps in, uh, if Donald Trump was a little bit more of a usual type president, uh, the economy was doing well uh, eight months ago and uh, isn't now. Um, you know, the two, the two most important um, factors in elections these days are partisanship and negative partisanship. And I, I think you had uh, Professor Liliana Mason do it, uh, do one of these a few, few weeks ago, and she'd be the one to tell you that. Um, that, uh, you know, the, the people who are, are um, uh, think of themselves as Democrats, that's part of their identity. And they have so many things that are wrapped up in that identity uh, that they're not open to, to um, you know, a candidate on the other side that maybe speaks to them. And the same is true of Republicans. Now, when we think about how popular Donald Trump is, you know, you got to think about, well, what, what are the different chunks of his constituency, right? So how, how, what's his real, real, real base? You know, the, 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 the real core of his base would be those people who liked him in 2016 and voted for him in the primaries in 2016, right? Those, that's about 20, 25% of the population. Well, he got somewhere, he, somehow we got from there to 46% of the vote in 2016. So he got that by, you know, bringing in some people in his party uh, who might have supported people like Marco Rubio and, and um, Ted Cruz, who bashed him all through the 2016 primaries. But in the end decided, you know what, we hate Democrats so much that we'll just stick with Donald Trump. And over the past four years, they've gotten more comfortable with that idea. But still within that 46% of the vote that he got in 2016, there's people who, you know, four years ago were saying bad things about him, who might, would have preferred Ted Cruz or anybody else or any other Republican. So maybe 46% is really his ceiling. And you see perhaps mishandling of the pandemic or that Joe Biden isn't such a bad guy or the economy is tanked or you know, his tax returns or something like that. And you see you know, some, some number of people maybe who didn't like him uh, in the primaries in 2016 willing to uh, either stay home or try Biden. I wonder if you could say anything about uh, other countries. Is there any other country that has a convoluted process like this for selecting their chief executive? No. <laughs> Nothing comes to mind. And, uh, you know, as I said, Canada is an example. Um, uh, it, it's difficult to figure out what's the right way to translate votes into seats and votes into power. Uh, in, in Britain, I don't think anybody's won a majority since before World War II. Um, but you've had you know, lots of majority prime ministers. Uh, what's, I think what's really unusual about the United States is that it's not like it's, it's a parliament um, where this is an odd way to choose the head of the parliament. You're choosing one person and this is not really a, I don't know, it, it, it's not what we would consider the smartest way to choose one person in a modern country where you can count all the ballots up in a night. Well, in a usual year, you can count them up pretty quickly and decide who got the most ballots. Uh, so, you know, Trudeau winning with 33% or uh, um, British prime ministers winning with less than 50%, that's part of a parliamentary system. But if you were, if you, were you know, in a boardroom trying to figure out, well, who should we pick for this? Or even if you look at the 50 American states that all have to elect governors, nobody has an electoral college at the state level right? No state has said, you know, the smartest way to choose our governor would be to have each of the counties vote and to count up the counties and then to have some kind of internal electoral college within the state of Washington. Nobody does that because it doesn't make much sense. Okay. So, um, so somebody online asks uh, about swings in party control of the White House. Why are they so important, especially in that primary model you were talking about earlier? You know, what why is it that that's so important in predicting future elections? So I, I think that 
one of the fundamentals or maybe the most fundamental of all fundamentals is that people are dissatisfied and dislike politics. Um, general dissatisfaction with the political process and with the political parties and with the way things are, that's really a constant in American politics and gotten worse over the last 40 or 50 years. What I think varies over time is who gets blamed for things not being perfect. So it's, it's easy to blame a party that's been, in, uh, that's been in power for a long time, right? So in 2016, if people thought the country's not doing great, there's still all these problems, whose fault is it? Well, they've had Barack Obama for eight years. And so when they think, you know, what will fix things? Not another Democrat, let's try something new, even if it's, you know, somebody unusual. Uh, and so they decide to try uh, Donald Trump. I think after four years, that dissatisfaction, it's kind of hard to tell who to blame for it. So in 2004, the country was starting to get pretty dissatisfied you know, with the, the uh, way the Iraq war was going. And did people think, well, things aren't great. Is it all George Bush's fault or maybe it's Bill Clinton's fault? George Bush didn't have full ownership of all of the issues yet because he'd only been in for, for four years. And so the electorate is sort of saying, if I can say that the electorate has one voice, it's sort of saying, all right, we'll give them another four years to sort it out. And the same might be true in 2012. Things weren't great in 2012, but when you looked at, you know, why is the economy coming back so slowly, people could still look at Barack Obama and say, yeah, it was George W. Bush's fault. And so I think, you know, after four years, people are starting to get dissatisfied, but they'll stick with it. After eight years, nah, it's enough, it's time to try something else because things, people just aren't, aren't gonna find that things have been fixed. Very, very occasionally things are so bad that they throw at a president that could happen this year as it did to Jimmy Carter. Very, very occasionally things are going well enough that they'll elect somebody to a third term, um, you know, like George H.W. Bush in 88. Okay, so um, I wonder if you can say, I didn't, I don't know if you read the Chiapolo case. Um, I wonder if you could talk a little bit more about that, this idea of, of faithless electors. Uh, it is striking to me on the one hand that in a court full of, of justices who, who, who purport to believe in original intent, they came out in that case the way they did, right? Because, because certainly I, I think the framers never intended that uh, states could bind their electoral college votes. But on the other hand, there would also be tremendous chaos if if you couldn't do that. So I, you know, what, what's your view of that decision? What's your view of the idea of faithless electors more generally? Um, you know, I, I guess I would, would have been one of, one of many people who were coming up with scenarios in 2016, how faithless electors might have uh, played a role in determining who the next president was going to be. Um, but, uh, you know, it, it originally, part of the, the explanation of, of the Electoral College was that this would be you know, a group of elites who perhaps would swoop in and save the country from uh, a populist president, from perhaps somebody like uh, Donald Trump. And now the idea that elites would swoop in and deny, uh, you know, deny the, the rightful winner, um, it's hard to imagine that that, that would be uh, seen as a legitimate thing. Um, you know, so, so there are occasional faithless electors. They've never mattered. They've never swung an election one way or the other. Um, but I think at this point, you know, as many ways as you can have, you can try and inject some legitimacy or some certainty about the process, I think is helpful as the country tries to, to uh, really needs to build back some of the norms of, of democratic governance. So. I think that you know a state like Pennsylvania, um, there's a there, there might be a lot of problems in Pennsylvania uh, this year of how the votes are counted, how the electoral votes. If you can start making a few things more assured, like if if Pennsylvania decides that Donald Trump won, that Donald Trump is going to get those 20 electoral votes, you know that little bit of certainty I think adds legitimacy to the process instead of well there's still the chance that some of those 20 will decide now nah, forget it I'm I'm going my own way. Um, I, or I, I'll, I'm not going to respect the voters of the state. Um, so I, I, I guess I, I prefer the, the decision uh, as it was made. Okay. So, so yeah, I probably have time for one more uh, question. That, 
So maybe you could predict, uh, since you're in the, the business of election forecasting, uh, predict how uh, litigation over these mail-in ballots is going to really impact the Electoral College vote and this selection of electors. You know, how's that going to play out in places like Pennsylvania or Michigan, for instance? It, it, so it could be like Florida in, in 2000, but in five or six states at the same time. Um, you know, it wasn't, the Supreme Court didn't decide the 2000 election by looking at all the evidence and saying, okay, George W. Bush should be president. They, they weighed in on a particular case about particular ways of, uh, of uh, counting rules. And so that I would imagine that any place where um, Donald Trump is ahead on election night and then votes continue to be counted any state where, where his campaign worries that once those votes are counted, he'll be behind, they'll be filing lawsuits to stop the counting, right? So if, if the morning after the election, uh, Donald Trump is ahead 100,000 votes and there's 2 million uh, votes uh, coming in by mail or postmarked by election day that have to be counted, he'll, he'll be saying, he'll be trying to get those votes stopped. And then the courts will have to come in and evaluate those questions. And that could be happening in a lot of states. Um, and so the courts could play a big role um, in determining what, what the rules are. And, um, and it's, it's going to be messy. Yeah. And well, as a guy who studies courts, I kind of, I'm, I'm kind of looking forward to that, actually. <laughs> <laughs> Although I'm not looking forward to it for democracy. So I, I'm afraid our time's up right now. Let me remind everybody that tonight is the first presidential debate that's uh, scheduled to take place at 9 p.m. Eastern time, 6 p.m. our time out uh, here on the uh, West Coast. So make sure you tune into that. Our next event in this series is next Thursday on October 8th, again at noon to one. We'll have Barry Burden, who is the director of the Elections Research Center at the University of Wisconsin-Madison. He'll be speaking about the politics of voting and election reform. Now, if you want more information about our upcoming events, again, you can like us on Facebook and we'll send you information about each of our events, or you can go to our website at foley.wsu.edu. And now I want to thank Matt Lebo again for a really uh, terrific uh, conversation. I see he shut off his, his, oh, he's back again. Thanks again, Matt. It was a terrific presentation and uh, really enjoyed it. Very informative. Okay, thanks. That was fun. I'm sorry for the AV difficulties. No, no problem. So again, um, uh, I hope to see you all next week and we'll, uh, we'll uh, see you then.